Hey, my name is David Koenig, I'm a general practitioner in Exeter and I'm here with Peter Goadsby to discuss um, aspects of headache on behalf of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Uh, this is the second video of our first fact sheet, so I think we'll call this 1B. And Peter, what I'd like to do, we've talked a little bit about the classification of headache. I'd like to pick up on secondary headache really, but before we do that I'd like to pick up on tension type headache, which is an important primary headache because we won't be dealing with it elsewhere. I guess we all get tension type headache from time to time, 70% annual prevalence, I mean it's the most common headache out there. And I think it might be worth just starting with the IHS classification. Um, so it's headache that lasts from between 30 minutes to 7 days, so a much broader time span than migraine. And it has to have at least two of the following characteristics, bilateral location, non-pulsatile, pressing tightening, mild or moderate intensity, not aggregated by routine physical activity, and both of the following, no nausea or vomiting, and no more than one of photophobia or phonophobia. So looking at this classification, it seems that tension headache is not migraine. Yes, uh, that, that's its biggest problem. Uh, as you say, tension headache is, uh, not, is not migraine. Te from my point of view, I, I think a very good first pass look at this is that tension headache, tension type headache is featureless. And I, I actually don't make the diagnosis unless a person has no throbbing, and no light sensitivity and no sound sensitivity and no nausea and no sensitivity to movement. Remarkably, a person with tension type headache will, could go and dig a road in the middle of summer and it will distract them from their headache. Very few micronerves will do that. So tension type headache, headache, full stop. And migraine is headache with features. Mm -hmm. I think that's a sufficient dis D uh, distinction to be about 95% right uh, in clinical practice. But the problem is so many other types of headaches present with a featureless headache. I mean, you could just think of brain tumour for a start. So tension type headache isn't almost a category in itself. It, it could be anything, couldn't it? Yes, the biggest problem with tension type headache is, the, as, the, is that because it's featureless, um, it, it, it makes you more nervous than troublesome headache, which mm. is usually migraine. And I agree with you, tension type headache is the commonest appearance of a brain tumour headache. So, you know, if you can't elicit any features in a way, that's the time to be, uh, the, to, to, to be anxious. I think it's true to say in general, uh, general practice that everything's around making the diagnosis. So if you can get the features out and make a diagnosis of a, a primary headache type, that's great. If you can't get any features, then um, you, have the, you, you have this problem. Um, you, you do the exact physical examination and you don't find anything. And I think that you've um, written on uh, and, done, and looked into what, you know, what's a reasonable thing mm. to do in this regard, haven't you? Well, I think we'll pick that up in, in, in one of the future yep. videos when we look at the examination okay. and history. So um, perhaps if we could go back to, to what's going on with tension type headache. I mean, a good story for the patients is that it's muscle tension. I mean, they like that because they're often, it's often comorbid with anxiety. They're often depressed. There's often things going on. And you can explain very nicely that, that you know, it's the muscles that are going into tension with their anxiety, but that's not really the story. No, there's not, not a shred of evidence that that's true, actually. Uh, when you look at so muscle tension in migraine and tension-type headache, the proportion of people with, muscle, with increased muscle activity on electrophysiological studies is greater in migraine than it is in tension-type headache. Um, so the... the Tension-type headache, for as far as we can tell, um, is uh, featureless and involves a misinterpretation of normal pain signals, full stop, mm -hmm. and is a largely brain-driven disorder, as, as far as it seems to be at the moment. But it's, uh, it has to be said, because it's relatively rare, or as you correctly said, it's very common in the population, it's relatively rare in doctor's surgeries mm -hmm. and even rarer in referral clinics, mm. it's a vastly under, under, understudied problem. I mean, some people would say it's part of a migraine spectrum, at, the, at one end of a migraine spectrum. Would, would you agree with that? I think that there's an end of the migraine spectrum that's less featureful, but I actually think that there are, is a distinct condition, tension type headache. I think I see it rarely um, because I'm captive of what mm. I'm referred, and I think it's not as disabling as migraine. I, I'm, and I think it is different, but I, I suspect that I'll die without knowing the answer to that because it's not enough is sent to me to, to make right. a diagnosis. What about tension type headache in a migraineur? I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to make a diagnosis of, of neck pain 
which would seem to fit into the tension type headache classification in a migraine suffering. And in fact, these headaches do often respond to trip dance. Exactly. Um, migraine is an inherited tendency to have headache with features. And that's, so in saying that, I'm saying that when someone sleeps in, they might get headache, or they get headache with their periods, or they get headache when they uh, get tired. And li a problem with that is that a, a mi migraine, I think, can have milder manifestations where it doesn't, the pot doesn't fully bubble over. So I think that, that migraineurs will have very bad attacks that are very obvious, and the nausea and vomiting and all the things we were talking about in the classification mm -hmm. in the first video. And, but they will have my less evolved attacks, and I think probably they're all part of the migraine biology. And we're talking about biology, the inherited migrainousness, versus how it manifests itself. And sometimes they ma the, the migrainousness manifests itself as obvious attack, and sometimes as a less obvious attack. In practice, if I find someone who's got features of migraine, I think I'll, I deal with that biology and see what's left. Mm -hmm. That usually works pretty well. Okay. So let's say we've made a diagnosis of tension type headache, treatment, treatment options. Yeah, if you make a diagnosis of tension type headache, the, uh, for, and the problem is really prevention not rather than the odd tension type headache for which most people will just buy some aspirin or ibuprofen over the counter, the, the really evidence-based uh, approach to that is, uh, is amitriptyline mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm or uh, cognitive behavioural therapy. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I think that, you know, it, it, all things being equal, if the resource is available, it's vastly preferable to try cognitive mm -hmm. behavioural therapy first before wheeling out a tricyclic. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually, a, there's a randomised control trial comparing them, so you're on safe evidential ground um, for, for doing that. And after those therapies, actually there, there is no other evidence base for it. You really start to struggle after that. Mm -hmm. Mitrazepine, do you use that at all, or do you think that's if there's any evidence? Some people use that. Is there any evidence base to support? Yeah, that? there is a small there is a small evidence base for that, and I think that's a reasonable next choice. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think one of the things with amitriptyline, which will crop up again when we're talking about migraine, is it's important to use it properly because so many people start with a too high a dose, and the patients just don't use it. Yes. So, so do you, what's your sort of pro forma for? Do you have a, a starting dose in a? In a <coughs> yes. Um, the, my the pro form the, the the way I approach uh, amitriptyline is. Is a little is either to start at ten milligrams or twenty five milligrams, mm -hmm. depending on their on their weight, fr frankly, and to uh, edge it up slowly. No, mm -hmm. I, I make changes every two, three, four weeks, depending a little bit on the profile. And, and you know, you, you've got the patient again in you know, practice. You, you've got the benefit of having seen how a patient mm -hmm. responds to a whole lot of other things, and you mm -hmm. know already whether they're very sensitive or not. Um, so I guess you're in a position well, mm -hmm. better than I am to. Um, be able to uh, to sort of judge the rate of uh, mm. increase, but I agree with you. Start low, go right. slow. Well, I tend to start a bit lower. Five milligrams would right. be my maximum, and, and in fact, sometimes two point five. You can buy very nice little pill guillotines from about a pound from from the pharmacist, which people don't know about, and you can cut them into two point five. And I think quite often people start too high. I think mm, side effects don't okay. like this, so I, I'd say start as low as possible. But I probably increase them a little bit quicker than you would. Well, that sounds like good advice. I didn't know about the pill cut. Yeah, well, lots of people don't. You yeah. get them for a quid from the pharmacist. Okay. They're very useful. <laughs> that sounds. I like used good to prescribe amitriptyline syrup, but it's very expensive. You know, you could, I could dilute that down. But yeah. pill cutters are good. And, yes. And start low and work up. Um, up to what sort of dose? I mean, I, I people don't like taking amitriptyline because they have this thing about distinguish about antidepressant. They also was isn't it an antidepressant? And certainly at 150 milligrams, you get an antidepressant effect, but it's very rare that you have to go up that high in headache. Yes, in headache, the typical dose you'll, you'll need is about a milligram per kilogram of body weight. I don't know how that, mm. I don't really know how that translates into pounds, but um, I find that very useful um, in a practical sense. I tell people a milligram per kilogram of body weight, and I tell them to go and weigh themselves. And uh, when a, I think it's useful for a person to know that the dose is aimed for them, mm -hmm. not aimed like for any person in the street. And it gives yeah. them a little, uh, uh, it, it, it lets them understand that it is a bit about individualization and it is a bit about being careful. And it, it's a, there's a buy-in then to get to a, a particular dose because it's suitable for you. Yeah, that's a useful point actually, good selling point. Okay. Um, well, that's a bit about tension type headache, and we look forward to further developments there because it is a bit of a mystery, I must mm. say. But uh, perhaps we could move on to slightly firmer ground with some of the secondary headaches. And I'd like to kick off with um, the headaches attributed to vascular disorder. And the first one of those is really the biggest cause of neurological litigation, and that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mm. 
um, often a big problem with non-diagnosis or mm. failure to recognise it. But most people, well, 50% of, your, uh, of people will be unconscious, I guess, at presentation, but yes. the others will present with headache, won't they? Yes, exactly. And, and that's a specific type of headache that we cannot really not recognise. Boom. W worst sudden onset, cricket bat over the back of the head, headache, apoplectic, horrible, bang. That uh, is the headache typically of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And when a person tells you that, it is hard to ignore what they say. Yeah. Um, the problem is, uh, as we all know, and you know better than I do because you face with this problem, is that uh, that can be a presentation of sex headache and it can be a presentation actually of migraine that's coming on quickly. So, but that is indistinguishable. The thunderclap headache. Yeah, thunderclap headache, <laughs> sudden onset headache. It's indistinguishable on clinical grounds from, from a subarachnoid. So you have to regard thunderclap headache as a subarachnoid until you've proven that it's not. Mm. So anyone that have presents, no comfort. Anyone that presents with a subarachnoid, a, 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 th thunder sorry, thunderclap headache, maximum intensity within a minute, straight to casualty. Straight to casualty. You do have sometimes. I've had it, the last one I tried to say. And I had a bit of trouble getting the SHO to accept. They said, "Oh, they all come in, and they all have a CT, and they all have, and they're all normal." Yeah. In fact, about ten yeah. percent, I think, of, of uh, thunderclaps are subarachnoid. That's so right. there's still quite a, there's quite a high false negative, isn't there? There is a. That's right. Um, you know, it's fine. If I was the SHO, I'd be happy for normality because it's easy and the person goes home. The, you know, the problem is that there's this condition is it kills people. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, if the, if the SHO wants to have their name on the death certificate, that's absolutely fine. Get the name and write it down. But they need to, there's no, it's unacceptable not to send these people along and it's completely unacceptable for the emergency room people not to do what is their what is their duty because as you say missing it is a huge cause of litigation mm. and put that down for a second people die it's unacceptable yeah.